I'd never really narked out before. Yeah. And I looked at my watch, and, and I'm still going down, and I'm at 189. Oh, wow. And I fucking, I looked over to my left, and I swear to God, like, I 100% believed this, right? Like, I was hallucinating. And I went, ha, huh, there's an owl down here. That's fucking weird. Hey, everybody. I'm Eric Obremt, and you're listening to Be Authentic or Get the Fuck Out. We talk about real shit what's on our minds, and don't give a fuck if it makes you feel a little uncomfortable. So sit back, strap in, and get ready for some real shit. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Be Authentic or Get the Fuck Out. I'm your host, Eric Obrant, back here at Wind the Storm 2024, and we have an exciting guest today. Uh, this is going to be fun. So I got to know this gentleman just recently, and uh, we become friends, and he's going to be going on a scuba diving trip with me, and I'm really excited to get to know him a little bit better here in this episode, find out kind of what he does and how it can benefit other people in our industry, um, even though I know we don't spend a lot of time talking industry stuff. Uh, this is this is going to be an interesting conversation, and uh, I'm, I'm really excited to move forward. So I want to introduce my guest today, Woody Casey. Woody, thanks for being here, brother. Thanks for having me. It's, I'm really excited to be here. There you go. Mike, up your fucking nose. Mike, up there, my nose. There All you right. go. There yeah, we yeah, go. Yeah. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm, I'm tired. It's been an exhausting couple of days, but... It has, hasn't it? I'm an introvert, so going yeah. to these things is out of my comfort zone. Yeah. So it's a lot of being on for everybody, yep. and it's exhausting. It is. I, I, I mean, because to be completely transparent, like, I... I am also an introvert. Like We've I like, yeah, I like fucking, I like being in my room and yeah. chilling out and uh, you got to come out here and do this and turn it on. But like, I love doing this just because I get to have like cool, fun conversations, you know, with people. So yeah, it's, I, I, and I appreciate you having me on here and you mentioned scuba diving earlier. That's why it's like scuba diving so much yeah. because it's completely, you're, you're surrounded by nature. There's no noise. There's nobody talking to you. You get to be one-on-one -on -one with yourself, so to speak. Yep. So I, I, that's why I do that. Do you uh, do you do what I do? Uh, my first dive of every trip, as soon as I jump in and I start going down, I pat my pocket looking for my phone. Yeah. Yeah. I've done that. It takes me like one or two dives before I stop. So I have a buddy of mine that we did a lot of training with, and he dives when it gets cold, he dives in a dry suit. Yeah. We're in 30 feet of water, and his phone rings. And he goes, crap. No you, shit. Yeah, you can hear it ringing underwater. It's it's one of the most funniest things That's I've ever seen. Hilarious. And he's like patting himself. He's in a dry suit, so it didn't bother so it didn't his bother. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's funny because he's like, oops. How deep did you go on that uh, dive? On that dive, we were probably 75. Okay, I wonder how, how deep can the phone go without... I don't, I don't know. I'm curious, actually, now. Yeah. Because so, I would have never thought of that. Yeah. Well, we were doing a training dive in uh, um, New Mexico at the Blue Hole. Okay. So it's just training, and it's a little bit colder, so... Yeah. He was in a... Because he's in and out of the water constantly all day, training different groups. So, but yeah, we were doing a... Re I think we were doing either advanced or rescue, and he was... Uh, his phone rang. When did you start diving? Um, so I, I did my first open water in... God, I got to think. Oh, back then. It was 97, 96. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, uh, but I didn't start active until 05. Okay. So when my son got to be old enough, um, I'd had a great year. And I'm like, he's old enough to start diving. It's something I've always wanted to do. But I'd never done it. Um, I'd done my open water because we're supposed to do a trip to Mexico. And I did my open water in a weekend to get certified to go. And then my buddies said, they're like, we're not going. So I'm like, well, screw this. Right. This sucks. And I got certified in... October in Rapid City, South Dakota, water temp was 45 degrees. Wow. Came out, and we were in a blizzard on one of them, and it was fucking cold. And I'm like, well, this is no fun. What were you wearing? Uh, seven mil. Seven mil? Seven mil to do your skills. You imagine that's taking your mask yeah, off that's and putting it back on fuck. with a like, full hood and yeah. some big-ass gloves. Yeah. Yeah, it was ridiculous. Your face had to be freezing. It was. Too. Yeah. And then you got, you got to take all that wet gear off yeah. and get clothes on, and we've got blowing snow. Oh my god! Yeah, it's terrible. That's fucking horrible. When I when I got my <laughs> when I got my open water cert, I did it in a rock quarry in Atlantic, Iowa. Yeah, and uh, it was a, it, I didn't have to wear a seven mil. I, I think I had to wear like a five or something. But like it was so you couldn't see. Yeah. Either like I don't know what yours oh, yeah. was like, but like I couldn't see from here to you, right? And I remember my instructor had to literally grab my fucking shirt and like pull me like this close 
so that I could do my skills and he could watch me. And I was like, this is fucking terrible. There's a sand pit that we do some training in Denver. That's yeah. like that. Visibility, you can't see more than two feet. No. So you got to be, I mean, you're almost nose to nose watch them do skills. Yeah. So. And then go do your stress and rescue in that. Yeah. Which I did. So I did my stress and rescue and my instructor was like a big fucker. And he, we're, we're down and we're swimming and he does the whole like, you know, go limp, fucking, yeah. you know, going to have a seizure or whatever. And so I grab him, and I grab his rag, and I start to inflate to pull us up. And that fu- and you can't see anything, right? Right. And that fucker, he knew what he was doing the whole time. And he took his foot, and he jammed it inside of a rock, under a rock, just to fuck with me. And, like, I'm going up and pulling him up, and all of a sudden we're not moving, but, like, the rest of my body is. Yeah. Right? Like, you really learn to improvise. Ours, he put on extra 40 pounds of weight on his weight belt and went to the bottom of the... Uh, blue hole in new mexico and so he's down there limp and he's at 90 foot and so you got to go down there and get him and same thing you start inflating and you're like i should be inflated enough to bring him up and you're inflating and you're inflating and all of a sudden you start to move and then he let his fucking thing go and then you so just he, shoot he, he dropped 40 pounds oh fuck and it's like crap and you got to stop both of you and you got to you know, do your control descent so you're dumping air like crazy and trying to keep both of you and he's you know limp <laughs> That's hilarious! Wow. So, uh, actually, I, I, yeah. Before we get into other stuff, like I, I love talking about diving, oh, right? Me too. So, I can do it for hours. yeah, we could. I mean, we could do a whole episode on this. But um, where, um, where, where do you, where do you like to spend most of your time? If you're, if you're just going to be like, hey, I'm going to go dive, right? Like, not in the states. Like, if you're going to take off and go somewhere, where are you going to go? Belize. Okay. You like Belize? Belize is beautiful. Where, where? So I've dove Belize. I went to Ambergris Key. Um, and I wasn't impressed. Have you done the blue hole there? Yes, and I wasn't impressed with that. I, it was fun. So my, I liked the two dive sites around it. Yeah, right. The aquarium and library. I think it was like I they don't were amazing. Sites. Yeah, I, I just do because it was there, right? Because it was like at the blue hole. But like the blue hole itself, I, it was like cool. Do you know the story about that? About what? Um, Jacques Cousteau. A little bit, but why don't you tell everybody? Okay, so the blue hole, he wanted to bring his submersible, his his big deep water because yep. the blue hole is like four hundred foot deep or yep. whatever it is. And he wanted to drop his submersible in there, but he couldn't get his boat in close enough to get over the edge. And the Belize government wouldn't let him do anything to be able to get it over there. So he's like, fine, it, we're not going to do anything. And then I, th- I think it's three months, four months later, there was an underwater explosion ah. that caved in part of the wall. And then he was able to get his submersible to go in there. So really? an underwater explosion of unknown origin. So and nobody got called out for it. No, really, they couldn't prove anything. What year was that? That was a long time ago. Yeah. So and there's if you talk, so we do a lot of liveaboards. Okay. And that's part of why things are fun for me is because it's with a tight knit group of guys I've been diving with for 20 years. Yeah. And we we've been all around the world together, so it's it's just a fun group of people to be together. Yeah. So Belize was one of the best liveaboards I've done. For fun. Oh, okay. So I didn't get so, to do a liveaboard. I, I think a liveaboard in Belize would probably be way better because we're at that Ambergris Key. Like, I had to find a dive shop and like we yeah. took this rickety ass fucking little rowboat out and like you know motherfuckers, you know, like yeah. trying to get out and like getting through the cut in one of those is a f- bitch. It's it's kind of like diving in South Africa where you take the rubber ducks out and they've yes. got to come out and you got these huge waves coming out so they go sideways across yes. the waves and yes. then they see that one break and they hop over yes and the front end comes off the water you come crashing yeah down. Yeah, it's, yeah those are those are they're exciting for a different reason right but you know when when our group goes like i said there's about 40 of us in our group and there's about 16 that get on a trip and we do them we were doing them every year yeah sometimes we do two a year and it's just a good time to hang out with good friends that yeah you've known that you have dive together i mean you only practically see each other only for dive trips yeah and it's just hanging out and that's why i mean blue the blue um sorry belize the blue hole all that was really fun because we got to be on a boat and part of it is the crew tells you about stories about the things that go on like that's how oh, i learned about yeah, that yeah, yeah. so sure. you, you get some history we did a yap and plow years ago and we did um what's that uh so it's in micro indonesia okay it's where a lot of um japanese um American fights happened during World War II, and there's some islands there that got some really, really cool history. Yeah, and I like doing that stuff. I like finding out why is this the way it is. Yeah, why is this so important? Um, Truck Lagoon is there, which is the best dive site I've ever been to. Really, it's, I got to do that. It's um, 60 Japanese vessels were sunk in 48 hours, 
and you get to dive on the wrecks. There's still human remains down there from the Japanese soldiers. Really? Yeah, and it's for me, it's it's a lot of history. It's a lot of you can pay homage to somebody who died for the country. Yeah, I'm a huge you know patriot, but it's when somebody's willing to sacrifice their life for their way of life, it's it's you gotta honor it. And even if they fought against us, which they did, yeah, you still have to honor it. And going That's down really there cool. and seeing these skulls and these pieces of, of human remains that were down there, and these guys had no chance to get out of these ships when they got sunk. Right. And you know, you think about their last moments, and you know, it's it's really touching. Yeah. And I, I don't want to get too deep into it, but no, no, no. You know, That's the great. history that goes with it. That you know, um, the island of Pelagru was a. Uh, they thought they'd they clean the island out in three hours, and it took them three months. And they left the Japanese that have ten thousand soldiers there and said, "Fight to the last man, to the last bullet, to your last." breath because we're not coming to help you there's no reinforcements coming it is you against the americans until you're all dead and they did they stayed no they shit. Like crazy wow so, wow so wh- when was the last trip like that that you took with your group um it was right before covid oh okay and then the the dive company that we dealt with um bart's company we did uh, a lot of liveaboards through him mm-hmm. um he and his wife retired they bought a 51 foot catamaran and oh, okay. retired and they are traveling all over the world they just went through the panama canal last week and they're fucking living their best life oh cool i'm so jealous what were, so. Did, were you doing aggressors or like yeah what? okay a lot of aggressors a lot of aggressors yep and those are pretty comfy oh fuck are they okay oh, they are they are they're five star okay you get out of the water they hand you a warm towel and a hot toddy oh or, no shit you know, or a hot chocolate or, or whatever really they've got fresh baked cookies when you get out of the water it is it is five star diving all right it, i gotta do that we need to put a like I said, that was why I organized this thing, right, yeah. for us that we're doing in, in next month. Um, and uh, I want to make this an annual thing, right? Yeah. And maybe and may, here's my hope, right? My hope is is that these guys that are coming that aren't experienced, right, they get, they get their cert. They have my brother-in-law down there, gets, them, you know, gets their open water done and everything, and they become so fucking addicted yeah. that we make this cool thing, oh, right, I'm, and we do it I've, every year. So there's a bunch of us, a couple of us that are still from that core group that we kind of miss that. Yeah. And we're trying to get groups together. And if we can combine a yeah. that in, in what we're doing here or what you're doing here, I guess, um, and make a group and start doing aggressors. Yeah. I mean, they are so they're absolutely phenomenal. The food, they have a private chef who oh. cooks every meal. Yeah. We had a uh, um, the, the chef that we had when we did the Yap and Palau one. He was out of this world. I mean, he was making things, and it's like I have no idea what in this is it, what's in this. But it's how many delicious. days do you do? Four or five? Seven. Seven. Okay. It's, it's usually Saturday or Sunday to Sunday. Okay. So you get six days, of, roughly about six, six and a half or five and a half days of diving. And how many how many dives you do in a if day? If you do night dives, you're doing twenty five dives in a week. Oh fuck! Two in the morning, two in the afternoon, and then usually night dives. Are you just diving nitrox the whole time? You can. Yeah. I recommend it. Yeah. It helps a lot. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. So. But that's like four or five dives a day? Yeah. Okay. It, it's, not everybody does every dive. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But they. But you can. But, you know, me and a couple of buddies, we usually try to do the Ironman. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Get everyone. Yeah. So. Go tie your watch up at 15 feet and let it soak there for a while. <laughs> no, but. <laughs> I've, but done, we, we, I've we, done that. <laughs> we all dive. We all dive with computers and we all dive with multiple computers. But the reason is, is for that to make sure we dive our right profiles and we can right. keep diving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And your night dive is usually 30 foot. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. It's yeah. a shallow dive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. There's nothing I fucking love more than night dives. So, uh, just to brag a little bit, my yeah. deepest dive is 185 foot. Yeah. It was at in Truck Lagoon on a right. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But that is, that is. Did I tell it, you about my deep dive? I don't so, think you did. So, I was, down in, I was down in Grand Cayman with my brother-in-law. And uh, I don't remember why we were doing it, but he, he knew where this little sand chute was. And so we started going down, and he was like, let's fucking go. Come on, fucker, let's go. And I'd never really narked out before. Yeah. And I looked at my watch, and, and I'm still going down, and I'm at 189. Oh, wow. And I fucking, I looked over to my left, and I swear to God, like, I 100% believed this, right? Like, I was hallucinating. And I went, ha, huh, there's an owl down here. That's fucking weird. Like, there shouldn't be an owl down here. And, like, that's literally what I'm thinking, right, during the whole thing. And it takes, I don't know, like 10 seconds, right? And finally yeah. I'm like, that's not an owl. That's coral. And then he's still going, let's go. And we ended up going down to, like, 220. Wow. 
Wow. And hung out for like two minutes, you know, or whatever, and started working our way back up. But uh, that was the only time I've ever narked out. Like, you get lightheaded, yeah. and, you know, whatever. But, like, I had never really truly narked out where I fucking saw an owl and did that. Yeah. I accidentally went to 189 at the Blue Hole Yeah, as well. Because, like, you almost – you have a frame of reference with the stalactites or whatever, but, like, you don't really realize how quick – you go deep yeah. there, right? Like that took, and that took a minute to come up. So, my buddy that does all the diving for us, um, he narks at about a 145. Oh, really? Yeah. So, going down with him, I know that. And so, I watch for his behavior. Yeah. And the girl that did my open water, um, she had narked, and she goes, It was a good thing I had a dive buddy because she goes, I thought the fish needed to breathe off my regulator, so I pulled it out. To oh, to no. The fish. And so, she didn't have a regulator in. And her dove buddy saw that and grabbed her hand and pushed her break back into her mouth. She goes, I would have died. No She goes, because I wouldn't have recognized my problem before I was dead. Oh, fuck. So I haven't. That's I've crazy. I've gotten a little bit of uh, loopiness. Yeah. Um, but I have a different issue when I dive. Huh. I get hot and I get claustrophobic. Really? Yeah. And my brain starts to go into panic mode. because, And it took me a long time to realize that it was the heat. Of the of me just being hot, so I have to be really really careful on how much I die on how much outer layers I put on. We dove Galapagos. Everybody's in dry suits. In I mean, Galapagos, you're in dry suits. Yeah, it's cold. The water, I mean, I knew it was chilly, but I didn't know it was dry water, suit. Cold. Water temp is between 68 and 72 degrees. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know it was that cold. So I'm in shorts, an insulated rash guard, and a hood, and that's it. Everybody else is in a dry suit, and I'm I don't find. I mean, we hit the when we went to that thermocline that went from seventy two to sixty eight. You get the yeah, can't breathe for a second. Right. But other than that, it was fine. It's a little chilly, and I go through the air a little bit faster because I'm cold. Yeah. But the thing is, but is you don't feel cold, is what you're saying. I still feel it. Oh, you do. But the thing is, is if the minute I start getting hot, I'm looking for the surface. Really? Yeah. Interesting. And it took me. It took me probably three dive trips, maybe more, before I realized. So when I dive in the Caribbean and the water temp's eighty two, I'm having an issue. Because I overheat. Oh, really? Yeah, so I have to be really careful. And it's one of those things that when you're in cold water and you get hot, you can just dump water down the front of your, your, right. your wetsuit. Right. And it cools you off. And it cools you off, But yeah. I can't, you can't do that when all you're wearing is a BC and swim trunks. Yeah. And there's no cool Because that's water. all I ever wear is yeah. a BC, swim trunks, and a rash guard. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's all I ever wear. I don't even wear a rash guard because I get too hot in it. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. I never thought. I never, I never talked to anybody that actually gets hot. You know what I mean? Usually yeah. it's like water temps 80, 82. It's like your body temperature is going down, right? Yeah. Like you're going to get cold eventually my, if you do multiple dives. My internal thermo, thermostat gets, kicks in. That's and I wild. Hot, so. I think the next one that we do, I'm, I'm going to look into doing an aggressor or I something would, like that. I think that would be fun. I mean, depending on where you go, and, and the best thing about it is if you can plan it two years out so you can – book the right time of year to be oh, somewhere. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if we start, I bet they do book out fast, they do. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's easier, and, and I've got some friends in the industry that can help yeah. with that. But, yeah, you want to start booking it out because they're they're a little bit more spendy, but they're well worth it. But if you got two years to pay it off, it's easier to pay it off. You, right. you make your down payment of 500 bucks or whatever it is. Right. You pay 1000 bucks every six months, right. and it's paid off by the time you go. You just got to buy airfare. Oh, yeah. So, you yeah, know, yeah, and, and cool. the thing is you plan it out, people can budget for it. Yeah. And I'm, not, I'm telling you. The minute you do one, you'll never go one. Never you'll go. never want to go back to resort diving. Really? Ever. That's funny. Um, so, yeah, so if that's something that's interesting to you, cult culture movement, we're putting groups together, and uh, I think that I'm just I, – I was going to make it where we were doing different events during out, throughout the year, like we're going to go hog hunting and do some other shit, which I might still do, but, like, my whole vision of this was an underwater mastermind, right? Yeah. Like, put good men together, be able to spend time together and, like, you know, network and, and whatever, not whiteboard and shit, but, like, be together yeah. and, like, you know, like – Hopefully feed off each other. Well, if you're diving with a group, you put your life in their hands. Yeah. Because anybody who's done diving and gets into diving understands that things can go wrong underwater. Yep. And the, and the buddy next to you is your lifeline. Yep. And it, it, it creates bonds. Yeah, 100% you it know? does. Yeah. And you're fucking talking to each other underwater. Yeah. And you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. And you, it's funny, too, when you learn different people, like, do things differently, right? And how they swim and how they how fast they swim. It's like, yeah. I don't want to fucking dive with that guy. Like, he's fucking swimming too goddamn fast. I want to chill out yeah. and enjoy it. And I, I have a really good friend of mine. Her and I both carry cameras. Yeah. So we're always the last people through everything because uh, we're taking pictures. Are you still? I 
haven't had my rig out in a couple of years. Um, I've got I've got over fifty thousand underwater right. photos. So, so, and the reason I asked that is because somebody asked me that last night about filming and taking yeah. pictures and stuff, and I was like, you know what? I'm like, I did like I went and took the underwater photography class and like did all the bullshit, right? Yeah. I went and bought all the fucking gear and did everything. And for, like, the first two years, three years maybe, like, I religiously was, like, all kinds of shit, whatever. I've got thousands and thousands of hours and, you know, photos and whatever. And then the last, like, five years, I completely stopped. I'll fucking, I'll hook a GoPro to my BC and let it hang there. And if a big shark comes by or something like that, I might, you know, get a shot or get a little video of it real quick. But, like, it, it, it felt like it was pulling me out of the moment because I was spending too much time worrying about, like, it's like watching a concert through your phone. Right. Right? And I was like, I need to be here. Yeah. Right? Instead of focusing on what am I getting for other people to fucking see. So my expensive uh, rig, I jumped in the water in Honduras without the backing plate on it. Nah. Flooded it. And that was a uh, an oops moment. Yeah. But it's also one of those moments, like, do I really need to carry this camera? Do I really need to have this equipment? Right. So I'll still take it. Yeah. I'm not taking it everywhere. Yeah. But, you know, I've I've been extremely privileged. I mean, like I said, I grew up in small town Iowa, and I've been all over the world scuba diving. I mean, there isn't hardly anywhere that's on somebody's bucket list that I haven't been. Yeah. Um, except for maybe Rajon Pot, and I think it's about the only place I haven't been. But when I go to places like that, I'm taking my camera. Yeah. I may not take it on every dive, and I'll talk to the dive masters. I'm like, what's down here to see? Because I've got thousands of photos of right. clownfish and eels and sharks right. and right. you know I've got great shark stories if you ever want to hear them yeah. but it's it's I've done all that right I don't have to document it anymore but the first time you do it man I if you have any kind of camera even a GoPro yeah you know, you, you want to be able to, to look back and I've got some amazing photos where your uh, videos I mean where you're going over the top of this beautiful coral and you're like almost like in an airplane going over it going up and down with the current and stuff it's beautiful yep. and it makes for really great footage yep and I mean, I've got those, and I've showed them to friends and family, and yep. they're on the internet and stuff, and it's it's amazing. But the camera never does justice to what the actual scenery is. Correct. And it's it's. I, I mean, I've been I've seen wonderful sunsets all over the world. I can't take a picture of them because it doesn't do it doesn't justice. Do it justice. It, yeah. You can't yeah. landscape yeah. that. Right. So no matter how hard you try. Yeah. The fun part about this trip is that I hired somebody to just film for us. Oh yeah. So like I'll have somebody filming underwater yep. and you know. Aggressors uh, that comes with it. Oh, does it? Well, they have somebody that does that. Oh, you can buy cool. the CD at the very end. Oh. And usually what we do is we'll just buy one. Yeah. And then distribute it to everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, super smart. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's great. All right. Well, so all right. That was a lot of diving <laughs> talk. I love fucking diving talk. I do right. Too. Um. I do want to talk a little bit about uh, your your business. We we were talking about this the other day, um, kind of the a the name of it. But tell people what you do because I, I think it's interesting, especially if people that are watching are in the insurance restoration business or roofing or whatever. But go ahead and talk. So about it. we do auto hail repair. Yep. So we we fix cars. Um, I've been doing it since 1995, and it's been a it's been a wonderful career for me. I have a degree in business management, minors in finance and making economics. I was going to work in the corporate world, and growing up on a farm, I'm really good with my hands. And I kind of fell into this by accident and then just stuck it out. Mm-hmm. And it's been an absolutely wonderful career, wonderful road to be on. It's had its ups and downs like every like everybody's career. But we get I get to fix people's prides and joys. You know, people take more care and they look at their car every day. And it's amazing how many people have more love for their vehicles than they do their house. They take care of their house because they live in it. It's their home. But they don't have quite the same pride. Yeah. Because you drive your car out, everybody sees it. Right. Um, I have a story. Um, guy had a Ford Festiva. You remember those? I do. Little shit boxes. Yeah. But he brings it in, and, and it's brand new, and it's got hail. I mean, the car's worth eight grand, and it's got four grand worth of damage. Right. Of and I'm expecting him to cash out because that's the kind of people that own those kind of cars. And so I'm talking to him, and we're going through the estimate, and I'm like, "So, are you just looking to get the money out, or do you want to get it fixed?" And he goes, "Don't laugh at me." I'm like, "Dude, I don't laugh at anybody." He goes, "I'm a dishwasher." This is the only new car I'll ever own in my life. He goes, I wash it every weekend. Now I'm looking at this chip box of Ford Festiva. It's brand new, but I mean, it's a year old. But I'm looking at it, and I'm starting to see the care that he's taking. The interior's clean. The exterior's spotless. I mean, he's taking well care of this yeah. brand new car of his. He has pride in that car because as a dishwasher, he's looking at it going, this is the only car I'll probably ever be able to afford brand new in my life. That's his life expectation. But now I'm looking at this car with through his eyes. And I look at him, and I'm like... 
I'd, I'd be proud to work on your car. Yeah. I get a little choked up about it because he's got that much feeling for that little car. How could I not want to make that car look right? Right. So it's stories like that and people like that that I absolutely love doing what I do because I get to talk to people who have a passion about I'm I'm a car guy. I got 15 hot rods. None of them are done, so don't ask me for pictures of them because they're all in right. various stages of disrepair. Yeah. But I collect Just them. like everybody with fucking <laughs> hot rods, right? Yeah. Nobody's ever got one done. Well, the thing is, I get to travel over the United States, and I see cars sitting in somebody's yard or somebody's grove or somewhere, and I'll go, is that for sale? And they're like, make me an offer. And I'll make them an offer. They're like, okay. Yeah. Like, seriously, I would just buy another fucking car, and I got to go get a trailer, and I'll pull this car out of a, out of a grove in the middle of Iowa and <laughs> right. take it to my place. And right. Now what am I going to do with it? So I've got I've got some nice future nice cars. Future nice cars. One day. <laughs> One day. One day. Hopefully. I've got plans. How often do you get to spend time on that though? Um, never anymore. Yeah. So I've got cars that I've started, you know, started pulling motors out of, started doing some stuff, body work on it, and it gets put aside because we get busy. And then over the last few years I've spent so much time building my business and doing things like this that I just don't have time. Yeah. You know, but it's one of those things that, you know, I have a retirement plan, and one of my retirement plans, I tell everybody, is I'm going to have cars to work on. So when I retire, I'll have something to get up and do every day. My grandfather retired and sat down and never got up again. You know, he lived for another 15 years, but he never left his chair. Right. You know, it's one of those, I don't want to be that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I I don't know how long I have left on this earth, but I don't ever want to sit still. Right. You know, I, I, I love days off where I get to just vegetate and but I don't, get, I don't take those very often. Right. You know, those of us who are, own our own business and are driven, you know, it's hard for us to sit because we want to produce, we want to be out there being productive. So it's it's hard to take time off to, to just sit and relax. Yeah. So, you know, I'll be that way when when I'm, when I hang up my tools and I yeah. stop doing what I do. And, you know, I'd love to own a catamaran and I'd like to have a little shop where I keep my hot rods and I come yep. in and I've got one that I won't touch. Um, somebody else is going to do the whole thing, start to finish. It's a 47 Dodge Coupe, but I've got a small block Hemi to put in it, and it's going to be, it is one of those, I'm going to spend the money to have somebody else do it. Yeah. So, but every, all the other ones, I don't care. I can do it myself, so. That's fun. Tell, tell the story about the, about the name of your company and that, that the, uh, and what that means to you. And the. So the name of my company is AJ's Den, and my name's Woody. Um, so I started doing um, painless repair in 1995, and I worked for a company out of Overland Park, Kansas. And their training facility was in Omaha, where I lived. And it was me and my son. I'm a, I'm a single dad. So my son was, um, I got custody of him when he was little. And every time I would buy something um, at the store, if it was dollar one, I would pay with $2. 99 cents went back to the house, went in the jar, jar went to the bank. So at 95, when he was three, the company had been working for it. He said they could make more money if they didn't pay all the tax. And I was one of those that got him screwed. And I had an opportunity to come down to Dallas to work, but I needed money for tools. So... I look at my little three-year-old, I'm broke. You know, I, I got no money. And I look at my three-year-old and I'm like, uh, I need to borrow some money. And he looks up at me with his hands on his hips with a really mean look on his face and goes, how much? Now, he's three, right? but he's very, very smart. And when I say my son is smart, he scored 30 on his ACTs, 35 in math and science, and 36 is perfect. I'm a fairly smart person and I scored 19. So when I say my son is smart at an early age, he was. And so he looks at me, how much? I'm like, pretty much everything you got in the bank right now. And he looks at me and goes with a little disgusted look on his face, are you going to pay me back with interest? <laughs> look at my little three-year-old thinking, one, you wouldn't have any money if I didn't give it to you. Right. And now I got to pay you, you back. Fucker. With, yeah, you yeah. little fucker. Yeah, you little fucker. Got to pay you back with interest. So back in 95, I looked at him and I said, I'll pay you back with interest and I'll name the company after you. Because back in 95, yellow pages, white pages were a thing. Yeah. And AJ's didn't put me first in the phone book. A little bit of marketing from my yeah. college, you know, all that for that yeah. little bit of marketing knowledge. But I named a company after him. So we have been AJ's Den since 1995. We've been incorporated since 2000, 99 or 2000, I don't remember which. So it's, 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 uh, the name means a lot to me. Yeah. And I've had people in marketing going, you know, if you really want to get bigger, you need a more marketable name. You know, I'm not changing my name. Nah, fuck no. No, it's, it's AJ's Den. Did today. he ever have anything to do with the business? No. Well, he used to be my helper. Yeah. But when you have a kid that is that smart, yeah. so high school, um, he went to Columbine High. Um, he would get 100% on every test he took, but he wouldn't turn in any homework. He's like, Dad, why do I have to turn in homework if I can get a perfect score? I'm like, well, homework's 50% of your grade. Yeah, that's why. Yeah, that's why. I said, you got to play the game. <laughs> yeah. But he just, wouldn't, he just didn't want to play the game. 
And I've had conversations with math teachers and other teachers about him cheating. I've had other teachers go, he's the smartest kid in the room, he's smarter than I am. You know, so I've got, he got the dichotomy of that. And I didn't want him to be stuck in an industry that I wasn't sure where it was going to be in 10 years or 20 years. Sure. You know, I, you have to look out for your kids' future. Yeah, of course. And I wanted him to go to college because he's just that smart. Yeah. But by the time he got out of high school, he was so upset with the teachers about being accused of being a cheater that he had no desire to go to college. Mm. Hell, he didn't even want to finish high school. He got mm-hmm. accepted to Iowa State on his ACT scores. They said, we don't care if you graduate. You go, see, Dad, I don't have to graduate. I don't need a diploma. I'm like, combative little fuck. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, don't know, I don't know where he got that from. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's not from me. But he lives in Iowa. He works at a, uh, he runs a, a shift at a uh, airplane, uh, airplane where they build airplane parts. Mm-hmm. So he, he runs, I, it's, it's more involved than what I know, but yeah, yeah, a lot yeah. of it's CAD programming and that okay. kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, And during COVID, his shift was the only one that didn't get shut down. Oh. They worked the shit out of his shift, but yeah. you know, they're the only ones that he, they kept running. So he's happy. So as long as he's happy, I'm happy. So explain to me on the on the business side. You said you got, did you say you got a couple brick and mortars? But we then have three but, brick and mortars. But then you pop up when there's a storm, yeah. right? What, so, is that, what does that look like? Um, it's a lot of. Um, logistics. Yeah. So we have three brick and mortars, Denver, Minneapolis, and Dallas-Fort Worth. Okay. Um, we've been in Denver over 25 years, um, Minneapolis three, and Dallas-Fort Worth six. Okay. But we've chased hailstorms all the United States, and it's it can go a couple of ways. Um, we did stuff in uh, western Kansas last year, and our roofing partnership that we had with one of the companies there, they had a, a roofing company, they gave us the back half of their warehouse. So we didn't have to find a building. Gotcha. Um, Minneapolis, um, we went up there for a roofing company. They started getting us cars, and I couldn't find a short-term lease on anything. Ended up with a three-year lease, and we're going to be there probably for the next 20 years. Oh, sure. You know, it, it's just we, we, we built relationships there yeah. that just keep following us. So with. how do the roofing relationships work? So the, the, the short story is we went to win the storm about six years ago and realized that there's a partnership here. Mm-hmm. That there's a way to make this work. And the biggest complaint we got from roofing companies was lack of transparency and lack of accountability. Mm-hmm. You can pass out my cards all day long, but the guy you pass it to may or may not remember which roofing company gave it to right. me because they had 20 come by that day. Right. So I wanted to build a program where every lead given to us we could be responsible for. So we build a web page with our, comp- our uh, roofing company's logo on it and a, and a customer sign-up sheet, so to speak. And they go in, they click on it, they fill it out. It's got the customer info, and first, last name, email, phone number, and salesperson for the roofing company. And that way, and it gets emailed to us. There's an electronic footprint. And yep. We put all that in a job nimbus. We use job nimbus because it's something that roofing companies are familiar with. Right. It doesn't work for our industry, but right. it works because it gives us a good transition, and, uh, and roofing companies understand it. So we do that because it's not my client, it's yours. If you're putting a roof on their their house and I screw their car up, it makes me look bad, but also makes you look bad because you referred me. Right. So I want to always understand that relationship and that dichotomy that it's not my client, it's yours. Right. So that client is always yours. So the biggest thing about that is let's, you're out knocking doors and you get a house and we get the cars and we do a great job. They're going to remember us more than they would, and that's not a it's not a bad yeah, thing. Yeah. But people remember more who fix their cars than they do who put a roof on their house. Yeah, I've had two roofs put on my house. I could tell you one of those companies. Right, but I can tell you everybody shot my cars ever been. To. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's that kind of a relationship. So we do that, and then do you do the follow up then? So they 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 put the information into your little portal. Yep. And then it comes to you, and then yep. you reach out to the client yep. and say, our, "Hey, our team leads is out." So and so fucking. Yep. We yeah. say, "Hey." Joe from over at Valor Roofing or yep. whoever it is gave us your name and number. We're calling about your cars. And 99% of the time, they're like, yeah, I was expecting your phone call. Um, this is my car. Do you have your claim number yet? No, we haven't called the claim in yet. Okay, so you, I need you to call the claim in and then send us the claim number. And we'll take it from there. And we will do, if, it, if it's possible or if the customer needs it, we'll pick up and deliver the car from their house. Hmm. We offer that as a service to our roofing companies. The biggest reason is, is, I never want them to go, oh, i got to pull up my map and see how far I am from Woody's shop because right. they only want to do a 30-minute radius. Or right. Fuck that. Fuck that. You know, we, Denver, we have a lot of roofing companies. That, that's where our home market is. And we have roofing companies that go from Fort Collins all the way down to Pueblo. Right. Two hours either direction. And they're like, well, how far out do you want to go as far as you do? Right. Well, we're, we'll make arrangements. You know, yeah. I'll get a trailer and go down and pick somebody's car up because they don't want me to drive that far. So if you go do a pop-up, how, how much square footage do you need to be able to operate out of? Because you um, need to be inside, right? Yeah, we need to be inside. Yeah. Um, 
it depends on the, the, the volume of work. Um, usually we like uh, 1,700 square feet. Oh, okay, like 1,800 square foot bay you can yeah. work out of. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because 1,800 square foot. Um, I was just curious because I have a bunch of 1,800 square foot bays. <laughs> yeah, we don't need much. I mean, if we need more, yeah, those are great to get us started yeah. and to start volume. Yep. You know, because the nice thing about what we do is we can temper our volume by what size we have and how many techs we have. Yeah. You know, if, if it's going to be a storm where we need 20 techs, I'm going to need a warehouse. Right. I'm going to need a large warehouse. Right. Because 20 techs, you're talking about almost 100 cars a week to go Yeah, because I was going to ask, how many cars can a tech do in a day? Usually one. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, okay. If they're hard hit, a day and a half. Okay. And so we like that quick turn. And we also, the, the un, unlike roofing companies, we get funded quicker. Oh, do you? The minute we get our sub approvals, we get funded. Oh, shit. They cut a check. So, to you or to the homeowner? So we get or car direction, owner. <laughs> yeah, we get direction of pay. You do. So And they actually fucking acknowledge it? Yeah. Fuck, that'd be nice. And we even have insurance companies now that direct deposit. To you? To us. It's fucking wild. It is. So when it's an, so here's, here's one advantage. That Are your clients paying their deductible? Most of the time. And I don't like that, but it's, it's a, we, we can give appearance allowances. So if they don't want their belt moldings put on and they want to keep the dented ones, they're 100 bucks a piece. They, Got it. It's it's the so cost. you're doing the same thing as we are with like ACV money. If they don't want to do their gutters, they can right. keep the ACV money on their gutters, right? Right. But if they want the full RCV done on your claim, they're paying yep. their fucking deductible, yep. right? Yep. And I assume they're paying it like as soon as they drop the car off when they pick it up, usually. Oh really? Yeah. Because I've gotten to a point where like I just make them pay the motherfucker as part of their deposit. We've talked about that. Yeah, because otherwise they're just like they'll find nitpick and they're like, well, I think you should knock a thousand dollars off because you didn't do that. And like, go fuck yourself. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 industry normal for them to pay when they pick it up. Yeah. Because honestly, it's their last resort to make sure that they get everything done right. So if there's a flaw in the paintwork or you know, yeah, we've, yeah, we've, yeah, we've yeah, had, yeah, yeah. You know, it's their way of making sure we're held accountable. Yeah, sure. And we've talked about collecting it up front, but it's not industry normal, and it's really hard to get the hard to get it. No, yeah. I get it. It's hard for us too, yeah. right? It's just it's, it, yeah. They just they always seem to for for homes, they always seem to figure out a way. Like they don't appreciate the work that was actually completed. Right. Right. Like rarely does anybody say thank you. They just try and figure out a way. I wonder how I could keep some of this money. When you turn an eight thousand dollar car in a day. Yeah. And they go. You make too much money. Right. Well, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm fast. Yeah. You know, I'm it, good. That's yeah. why you're paying me. Yeah. And it, it's the industry rate. And here's the other side of that. Here's the dirty secret that they came out with a hail matrix that tells you how many dents per panel get paid this much. Yeah. That came out in 1999. It hasn't changed. Oh, no shit. I haven't had a raise in, in almost 30 years. Really? Yeah. Still getting paid the same rate? Yep. And I'm sure you got to pay your tax more. They pay. They get paid a percentage. Oh, they do? Yeah. Oh, Okay. So they make a percentage off the off the scope. Oh, of okay. We argue for more, and we and we are getting better at getting more. Yeah, and we can argue things. Yeah, and some of the adjusters understand that, and they're willing to work with us to go around things and help us get where we need to be. Yeah, but a lot of them are like, it's we get adjusters, same as you guys, that don't know the difference between a fender and a quarter panel. Right, and I throw those guys out of my shop. Yeah, you can't come here. Yeah, and I'll call their supervisor and send this guy back to my shop ever. Right, why not? He's not trained, and it's not my job to train him. Yeah, right. You know, I've got to argue. i got to argue dollars, but I can't argue dollars with somebody who doesn't know a car. Right. You know. Yeah, how can you? Yeah. Yeah, we do that every day. I know. Yeah, they're and like, they so don't fucking know anything. That's one of the things that when I come to these, we, I have a lot of um, relationships built on the fact that we have the same battles yeah. with insurance companies that roofing companies do. So we have a lot of same gripes with certain yep. insurance companies that are worse than others. Yep. Some used to be good. State Farm was great. Up until about five years ago. Yeah, same. And they went to shit. Yeah, same. You know, they're they're the one of the worst ones to deal with now, and they used to be one of the best ones. What's been interesting for us though is we find it like depends on the state too, right? Because State Farm will be good in one state, yeah, and then they'll be fucking garbage in another state. Right. Or the only one that across the board is always fucking bad is like Allstate. Allstate's always shit. It doesn't matter where you are. Progressive is hit or miss. Depends on the adjuster. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Um, and Progressive during COVID. They screwed a lot of their customers over because they wouldn't come look at a car for 28 days. Oh. Because they got the double the amount of time that they could to drag yeah, it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what, what most people don't realize is insurance companies aren't about insurance. They're about investments. Yeah. 
they're, they're, you pay your, your, your monthly premiums yeah. every month, and they take that money and invest it. Yeah. So if they can drag that that For another out, fucking 30 days, yeah. Yeah, they get yeah. to make interest on they're your money for money. another 30 days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and we have, you guys have worse than we do, but we do have times where they'll drag their feet for forever to, yeah. and they'll also tell you, you need to go to this body shop. Well, that body shop's booked six months out. We don't care. Because they get to hold on to your money for another six months. Right. They, 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 if they're paying me, if they grand, have, if they have a right to repair inside of the policy, you're saying. Well, anybody who has comp- comprehensive collision has hail coverage. No, I know, but you're saying if they say you have to go to this body they shop, they would have to have a right to repair in the policy. It's it's a it's a law that they cannot direct you to where to go, but they have direct repair shops, so they try to steer you there, which right. is illegal. Right. It's technically illegal. They can't do it, but they do it anyway. But they do it anyway. They yeah, do it they anyway. do the same thing on yeah. roofing. Yeah, yeah. So. Dude, Woody, thank you for being here today. For me. Yeah, I, I, yeah, this is awesome. Um, you know, the one thing that we do at the end of all of our episodes, though, is that a lot of times I'll have guests come on that, you know, they had something that they wanted to make sure that they talked about or, you know, thought of, or we started going down a path that we didn't finish. So I always give the guests, like, the last two minutes to, like, wrap up any thoughts or anything that they want to make sure that the audience hears. No, I mean, we, we got the scuba diving stuff yeah, out good. Of the way right away. So that's all I really, that's my big passion. Scuba yeah. Diving, so. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to spend some more time with you, hey, live in a fucking house for a week <laughs> and eat some good food and go diving and just, yeah. you know, get to know each other better. And everybody listening, hopefully you got, I know you got something out of this today. Um, like, share, subscribe, send this to all of your friends. We don't have any fucking sponsors. So Zen for all of your nicotine needs. Um, cinnamon's my favorite. Just tried coffee. I'm not, I'm not sure yet. So, but it's, it's, it's really good for you out here. Um, also no sponsors. So cult culture movement. If you're looking for a group of men to get together with and up level your personal life, business life, whatever it is, if you're looking for that accountability, um, and friendships and whatever, reach out to me to look at cult culture movement. Um, and you know, we'll see, we'll see if you're a fit. So this is really fucking annoying when I try to end a show and the goddamn fucking MC starts talking loud. But we're gonna wrap this up. Thanks everybody, share this shit. And remember everybody, to be authentic. Or get the fuck out. Get the fuck out if you can't be authentic. Get the fuck out if you can't be authentic. Yeah.